Good afternoon and welcome to New Life Online. It's great to have you join with us for our service. In a little while, we're going to be continuing our series called We Believe, where we're looking at the fundamental statements of the movement that we're part of called the Assemblies of God. But before that, we're going to have a song of worship. But before that, I'm going to join with all of us together in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of joining together. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us and your grace upon our lives. Father, we thank you for the things that, Lord, that you teach us through your word, that we believe statements that we can hold on to, that, Lord, can help direct how we live. And we pray that, Lord, through being together online today, that, Lord, that we will be, uh, Lord, enl enlarge our faith, Lord. We pray that you will encourage us, Lord, and we pray that we will keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace on top of grace More than I've asked for More than I'm worth Grace on top of grace How sweet the sound Once lost, now found Heaven came down And grace rescued me Your grace on top of grace. Lord, I you love me, I don't deserve grace on top of grace. More than I've asked for, more than I'm worth. Grace on top of grace. Genesis 3 says this, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. 
At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, that's why I ate it. Then the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed. More than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you'll give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he'll rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. We're going to continue today this series that we've called our, our We Believe series. And so far we've looked at how the Bible, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. We've looked at how we believe in the, the Trinity, how we believe in believers' baptism, the miraculous life of Jesus. And then last week we looked at the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how we believe that they are for today. And today we're going to go right back to the beginning of Scripture almost, to where it all started, right at the start of the, of the Bible and of humanity. And as I said, the, the title of what we're going to look at today is The Darkest Day in History That Required the Greatest Day. You see, the statement that we're going to look at today is a statement that says, we believe in the fall of man who was created pure and upright, but fell by voluntary transgression. Unless you've been living under a rock this week, that you'll understand that Scotland has been hosting what has been called COP26, this climate summit that's been taking place where uh, there's been world leaders and people meeting together to discuss and make decisions that will affect how the world operates when it comes to things of the environment and, and, and trying to keep uh, you know, the warming of the planet and things like that to particular levels. One of the, the verses that we would have read if we'd read Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 was it says that God put man in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Something certainly that as a human race we haven't always lived up to. You see, we see just now and we've seen with some of the things that's taken place, some of the concern and things that's happened because people are concerned about what the effects of some of, uh, you know, the, the, the warming of the planet and things like that that will happen. There are different theories on, on why it's taken place. There are some conspiracy theories. But none of that takes away from the huge question and the implications and things that are real within the world. And none of that takes away as well from man's responsibility or for, to look after the garden where God had placed them. That was one of the things that God commanded man to do. And when I talk about man through this, I'm talking mankind, man and woman. Sometimes Christians, do you know, what can happen is, and sometimes in people in the world, what we see is that we see when it comes to things of the planet and, and of creation, then what can happen is we can go either way. That in Romans, we read about how, how sometimes that people would worship creation rather than the creator, and then there's other times where, uh, you know, we can think, well, you know, Jesus is coming back anyway, that therefore everything will all be fine. But, you know, we still have to live in now, and we have got a responsibility to take care of the garden that God has placed us in, especially when they have incredibly serious implications and things like that on humanity and, in, and on injustice. So the We Believe statement that we're looking at today is about humanity. It's mainly humanity and the aspects of what the fall of man did to the human race that we're going to be looking at. But the reason that I mention what's happening in Glasgow and things like that just now is because I believe that what we see, it all comes from this catastrophic event that affected not just humanity, but the earth and I believe all of creation too. This event that took place, I believe, is why we have sickness, pain, death, killing, weeds, 
thorns, you know, all waste, all of these things happen. And it makes sense when we look at, at the picture of what the Bible describes through the creation narrative. This event had far-reaching consequences beyond, you know, Adam and Eve having a piece of fruit. In fact, Romans talks as well about the effects that this had on creation. He says I, in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to to, subjected to frustration, not by its own, own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay, to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to present time. And so by looking at this topic today, we believe in the fall of man, then what it can do is it can help us to make sense of the world. It can help us to make sense of some of the huge questions of where does suffering come from? Why do we have a moral code built into us? Why are some of our resources and things like that, why, is it, why, why are things not working in the way that they were intended to? And we also see in the whole picture the narrative, the need for Jesus as well. There's this great verse in the psalm that says, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, who, what is man that you are mindful of him? And I want us to think on that first part, when you consider. And this morning I want to base the kind of structure of this, whole, uh, of this message on these words, consider this, consider this. And this morning, I want us to look at different points of the story that can help us, as I said, make sense of everything and see how the darkest day needed the greatest day. So the first thing I want us to consider is to consider what God created. You see, this passage here forms part of the whole creation narrative in Scripture and what took place. So before this, we read in Genesis chapter 1. Now, in, in, in literature, and in, and in uh, works of great, or great works of, of, of uh, writings down through the years, you have some amazing opening lines. I wonder if anybody can tell me which uh, piece of work come, does this line come from? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Does anybody know where that one came from? Anybody? Charles Dickens is correct. Does anybody know the work that it came from? Well done, Jane. It was a tale of two cities. So we've got that. What, what a genius opening line. I love Charles Dickens' opening line as well. Uh, in A Christmas Carol, it says, Marley was dead to begin with. I just think that's a great opening line. I mean, you ever, you ever sit down and try to write an essay when you're at school? Thank the Lord, I'm past those days. But, uh, you know, it's the same with sometimes writing a sermon. You want an opening line. You want something, and there's some great opening lines. Moby Dick has the opening line, Call me Ishmael. These are some of the famous lines that are written down through uh, literature and down through works of great writings that are famous. But I want to tell you, the Bible has an amazing opening line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I love it. It just tells it as it was. It tells it what took place. Now, one of the things that you'll find as we go through these fundamental statements, these statements that we believe, is that actually one of them that we don't talk about is that God created the world in six days. Now, I remember asking a friend of mine if he believed that God created the world. He's a doctor, a very knowledgeable guy. He says, Do you, I says to him, I says, are you a literal six-day uh, creationist? And, and uh, because, you know, sometimes there are people who believe that, you know, certain aspects of the, uh, of, of the creation uh, poem, it tells the story, but tells it in a poetic uh, action. But I asked him this question. I, I says, Do you, are you a literal six-day creationist? And he, his answer was brilliant. He says, why not? And I loved it. Like, it was just this question of why not? Because you so, so often in the world, we love to prove things or disprove things. But there's something wonderful about God creating the heavens and the earth, something with an element of wonder and power. So why not? So if you were to ask me, am I a literal six-day creationist? Why not? Because I believe that God could. And if he could, then why not? Because that is the mighty God. He is all-powerful. We've already looked at this. Why no limits? But also when we consider some of the things today that actually can give an answer for some of the the, the, the 
questions within creation and, and, you know, some of the debates about how things take place and the age of the earth and stuff like that. Because what happened was that in the moment that we read about, something was broken. And the way that what was intended has, uh, was, was broken forever or until, uh, you know, God restores all things to himself. But there was something broken in that moment. And that's why we have waste and decay and all of these things that took place. But I love this definite statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, I believe that statement with everything. Because I look everywhere around me and I see the fingerprints of God. I see the fingerprints of God and the, and the wonder that we see around us. But I also see it in the, in, in the way that we are created, how we are all got an individual fingerprint. I think that's wonderful. That God's fingerprints are on our lives and his creative genius is on each of our lives in a unique way. It's breathtaking. From the largest of masses to the smallest of particles of matter, we see the wonder of creation. And I think creation tells of the glory of God. And next time you read Genesis 1, I would encourage you, read it with wide-eyed wonder. Read it and tune in to what God actually does as he speaks and says, let there be light. And there was light. Light and darkness, sky and water, land, sea and plants and fruit, sun, moon and stars. And I love how even on the days, and I'm, I'm talking there about some of the days that, that happened within the, the, the story of creation. And I love that when it says sun, moon, and it says this, and he also made the stars. Love that sort of thought. I don't know if you've ever go out. Uh, Jonathan and I have been going out trying to take some photos of the, the night sky this last week. And as we look up and, and, and as you start to see and you see the, the photo develop and you start to see some of the, 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 the actual sheer number of stars that's out there and just the throwaway line, and he also made the stars. It's like, it's like it was nothing, but yet the, the, there are billions of stars out there that we see, but he... Hey, he also made the stars. And so we see that, and then we see birds and sea creatures, wild animals, and mankind. And the Bible says that, that God made man and he gave us dominion over these things. So that's why I'm saying, what is man that you're mindful of him? When you start to think of all this and the wonder and the majesty of creation, then, then you know, we, we, it can cause us to worship God. He is breathtaking today. But one of what we've got to realize is that God made it, and it says that he saw it, and it was good. What God made was good. It was, it was, it was good. It was, it was as the world was intended to be. So the first thing we have to consider creation. The second thing I want us to consider is to consider the relationship that mankind had with God. So after the creation story in Genesis 1, we get the account of God and placing Adam in the garden. And if you were to read through that, it sounds like a wonderful place. The Garden of Eden teeming with life and all of the things around him. We have this amazing coming together of the voice of God and how he created man and breathed life into his nostrils, gave him life. And so before the disobedience of, of Adam and Eve in this story, then what we see is that, that, this, that man was created pure and upright. We read that in our, in our statement that we believe that God created man pure and upright. So before the fall, man had not sinned. They, they had done nothing wrong. At the time, it was good. It was how things were meant to be. And God placed Adam in the garden and asked him to tend and care for it. On a side note, do we tend and care for the garden that God has placed us in? Do we take that responsibility serious? And God saw that it was good, but also God recognized that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he created Eve and what God made was good, and the world was intended to, was as it was intended to be. They were in the garden. And God gave Adam what I believe was the single greatest job of all time. God told Adam to name the animals. What a job, right? So you can imagine, this one, imagine, I don't know how he did it, I don't know how it worked, and you know, if, if God brought him to this one, it was like, this one will be your best friend. This one will be loyal. Even if you give it a row, it will welcome you as if it was the best day it's ever had. Adam, we will call this dog. Great job. This one, this one will hate you, will think it's far better than you, will have an independent spirit, will think it's above you. We'll call that cat, right? 
So those of you who've been here long enough, you'll know that I have a joke about the cat and dog. If you're a cat lover, forgive me. We all love Jesus. It's all fine. Um, you imagine, imagine that. Like the next one comes along. Where did he come up with hippopotamus? I mean, just think on these things. Brings this one along. Oh God, you're having a laugh here. A duck-billed platypus. What in the world? Like, you know, what, what a job. Imagine being asked to, to name the animals. So God has this relationship with Adam. This is how it was intended to be. And Adam gets basically to live and tend and care for the garden, name the animals, and live naked with his wife. What is wrong with where God placed them? What a place. Yet we've got to consider some other things within this. We've got to consider the love of God and free will. And there's something within this passage that we've got to understand is that, that something of free will is also established. It says that you are free. God said to them, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God makes it plain in this one moment. And I believe that in this moment, what we see is we see real love in action. Because what we see also is this question that goes down through the ages. If, we, if, if God knew that we were going to break his heart, why would he make us in the first place? And you know, there's a, probably a huge, deep aspect to that. Like, why did he give man the option to sin? Why is that the case? You know, what I've realized is as a parent, and you know, in that we don't see everything clearly, I'm sure, in terms of how God sees us, but but, you know, we see in the, the joy that our, par- that our children can bring us at times. But we also at times see the pain that can happen when, when something happens to, to a child. And, you know, sometimes what we see is that, you know, I, I remember silly things. I remember one time Ariana came home from nursery. And when she came home, some child had cut my daughter's hair. Cut her hair. Do you know what? Like, even in that moment, I'm not saying I wanted to punch a four-year-old kid, right? But uh, do you know, there's certain things that happen because it affects us. You know, there's things that because we feel the pain, and that's only a small thing. You know, you you experience some of the, the tragic things that sadly some parents have had to experience. Why would God create us if he knew that he was going to break our heart? You see, there's sometimes there's things that happen in our lives. You know, people still have children today, even though there's the risk that they will break your heart, they will abandon you. There's all these kind of things. But there's some awesome moments of joy. Something about it that, that we see something of the heart of God. And as I said, these aren't perfect examples, but God is a perfect father. But it maybe gives us an insight. How God made us for his pleasure and he loves us. But you see, for love to exist, there has to be free will. For love to exist, there has to be free will. Otherwise, it's not love. If you think on any type of love in the world, there is always an option that a heart can be broken because that's where love is. And in this moment, what we see is that God laid out the, 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 the option for them that uh, you, know, you can uh, eat from any tree, but don't eat from that one. And in that moment, what we see, love. So in our lives, we have the choice of what we do. Do we follow God's plan or do we follow our own? And God laid out the consequences of what would happen. He says, from when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And today we have the choice, as I said, to live a life that honors God or we can live a life that goes down our own route. And all through scripture, we see how this free will option has been played out for us. You know, so in Joshua 24, it says, So when the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you're living. And Joshua says, But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We have a choice in what we do. In Revelation 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand, Jesus speaking, at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to eat with him and him with me, and he with me. What we see there is a choice. It's just up to us whether we open the door. So in life, we've all got a choice, and I believe that that demonstrates love. We know the consequences of what happens if we break what, how God meant for us to live. But we also have a path of blessing. So when people ask the question, and we'll look at this further down the line, that it's not fair that there's a heaven and a hell and all these sort of things, but actually it would not, it would, it would not be fair or just of love or loving if there was not. 
And these are complicated uh, things that we're talking about here, but, but if, if people choose to reject, then that is also a choice. God hasn't forced us to live a certain way. You're all sitting here this morning by choice because God has given us that choice. And you know, sometimes what can happen is in life that the others, the fruit that, that is out there and the things that, that are alternatives might seem attractive and an option for us at that time, but obviously, ultimately, the damage that can be done on our lives is great, which leads us to consider this this morning, the darkest day in history, and consider the circumstances. So the passage that we read has Adam and Eve disobey God. This is what we call the fall. In this passage that we read this morning on, in Genesis 3, you see, it's, you might be reading that and think, well, all they did was take something of a, a bit of fruit. But you see, in doing so, it wasn't a just about what they did. It's about why they did it. It's about what's being said in this. In this moment, it was to completely disobey what God had instructed. It was rebellion. You see, God's laws and God's authority and commands, it comes from his authority. God's commands and his law come from his authority, his goodness, his wisdom, his justice, his faithfulness, his grace, and his love. And so in disobedience, we reject God's authority, doubt his goodness, we dispute his wisdom and justice, we deny his faithfulness, we spurn his grace, and we refuse his love. You see, the fall was a contradiction of all of God's perfection. And what we see in this moment is that when they disobeyed God and they took from that fruit, that what they basically say is, I know better than God. And boy, have we been doing that down through history. You know, even in our lives today, maybe we have moments where we, 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 we face that. But what we see in this is the process of it. It's interesting. And that's why I want us to consider the circumstances and think on what the serpent said to Eve. He caused them to doubt God's word. They said, did God really say then he contradicted God's word to positively disbelieve it. You won't die. Totally go against what God had said, which led to them into disobedience. So it was doubt, disbelief, and disobedience. And what happens in our life is how often this, this pattern is played out in our lives. You see, the enemy still loves to deceive us. He tells us we'd be better off without God, promises much of what would happen, but delivers little in our lives. If you were to think today on the times where you've been tempted and the times that you've failed, the times where you've received things and you've not been satisfied, the times where you've thought something would bring joy or peace or whatever into your lives, and it hasn't. We see it in the small things. We see it in the big things. We see it when we think that the grass is greener on the other side. My dad always uses this phrase. You say, people think the grass is greener, but you've still got to cut your grass. And it's true. You know, sometimes in our lives, we think that there's a, a better, a picture of a better future outside of God's will. But what happens is, and this is the next point we've got to think of, we've got to consider the consequences. You see, Genesis chapter 2 ends with this phrase, they were naked and without shame. In chapter 3, verse 7, it once, the, the, the first consequence that we read of of the fall says this, that then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So all of a sudden they realize their nakedness and they're ashamed and they're afraid. Some things, these, these feelings that they'd never experienced before, they recognize that they needed clothing. And this is the first consequence that we read. It's far from the only consequence, but, but why is this significant? It seems rather strange that that's the first thing that they recognize. But actually, this too makes perfect sense. You see, in breaking this covenant, they are ashamed before God. But also, in breaking that covenant, they're no longer trustworthy between one another. Something has happened between them and God, and something has happened between one another. And you know, this is a picture through Scripture, this idea of unfaithfulness to God, intention between humanity. You know, it's the opposite of the kingdom of God, which says that we are called to love God and to love people. So the consequences of this moment are, that's the first consequence that we read of where there's something broken. But also what we see is within one generation, murder has taken place. So you've gone from this where everything was good and how things were intended, and within one generation, Cain murders his brother. 
And throughout creation, we see that there's sickness, that there's death. We see that across the generation. And all of this resulted in separation from God. And Romans 5 says this, Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged anyone's account from the, for the, where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. It's kind of deep, that language there, but what it's saying there is that, because obviously Adam takes place, and there's a, a good chunk of history before Moses is given the law on Mount Sinai that we looked at our previous series. But he's still saying that there's sin and there's death and all that that takes place within there, even though they don't know what the law actually is and what they're meant to do and how to keep it. But what's happened is that because of this action, something has entered into humanity and into creation. So sin entered through the world. So everything in creation, all of us, we grow old and die. The ground even was cursed. So we inherited something from Adam. We inherited a sinful nature so what's happened is that we've gone from man not sinning to after the fall, man cannot not sin. If you see what I mean? We all sin. One thing I recognized when I had children was that one of the first words you have to teach them is no. <laughs> no, don't touch this. No, don't do this. There's something within us. And even when you tell them no, they still want to do it because there's something within us. What happens is that they're faced with this Shame and nakedness and fear. And what do they try and do? They try and cover their shame with fig leaves. And it's interesting as well because don't we see that in our lives that whenever we do something wrong, what do we try and do? We try and cover up what we've done. We try and maybe hide like what they did. Or we try to cover it up by shifting the blame that we see all the time through this. I mean, if you've got siblings, you'll know you've blamed them at some point for something that you've done. Guaranteed. I know I have. And I've certainly been on the receiving end of blame of things that I've not done that they've accused me of doing. Because we like to shift blame. So what happens in this is that Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the serpent. But actually, we like to cover what we've done by, by shifting the blame. Or we try and cover up what we've done by not telling the whole truth. We try and cover up just simply by covering up. But what happens in this moment is that God covers them. So that they, they gave them animal skins and then they were able to be, to be covered up. And they, they, were, they were cast out from the garden in this sad point and they were not able to access what was the tree of life. And, but in this, what we see is that this picture that points of them being covered, and in a sense, when we clothing, all that sort of stuff, it points to our past failure, but also pointed to future glory. You see, all of the shame, pain, fear, sickness, sadness, all of that can all be pointed back to that day when man fell. And so when I started at the beginning of this and I talked about how this, what we're talking about today is the darkest day in history. Because it was. It was the day when, when sin entered the world. It was the day when, when all these things took place that that everything that is damaged and all the pain and suffering and things that we experience that breaks our heart. You know, I, I talked about some of the things that even some of us have experienced this week can all kind of be traced back to that day, the darkest day in history. But here's the thing. We need to consider the solution this morning. That God in his sovereignty knew what would happen even before it happened. And even before it happened, a solution had been given. Because what we read in John chapter 1 is we read of John the Baptist saying, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But what we also read in Revelation is that we read of the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. So God knew what the solution would be before the beginning of time. God knew. And God is love. And God didn't just leave us to our own devices. So when we read about in Romans 5 about how all these things happened because of one man's failure, then what we read in Romans 5, it goes on to say, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. This is why we worship Jesus today. Because he died in our place. 
You know, just as clothing and, and the, the skins and the, the fig leaves and the things that they tried to cover them up with, it pointed to a day when his blood was going to cover our sin and shame. It pointed to a day when we could be forgiven and be clothed not in, in animal skin, but be clothed in his righteousness. What a day. Because of the greatest day in history, Resurrection Sunday, when Jesus rose from the, the grave and defeated death, which was the consequence of the fall, the ultimate consequence, that actually as a result of, of what Jesus did, that we can have eternal life. That he opened the way for us to, you know, we asked that, consider the relationship. He opened the way for us to have relationship with the Father again. He opened the way for us to be naked and unashamed. And he promises to make all things new. Jesus was the solution. Jesus is the solution. That's why this dark day, the fall of man, was defeated by the rising up of the man Christ Jesus. Do you know, this morning I want us to understand that, that what we can see in this, it makes the world make sense. It makes why we have sin and shame make sense, but it also makes sense why we now worship Jesus. And I think all of this points to this, which I believe is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture, which points forward to a better day. Towards the end of the Bible in Revelation 21, we read this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it's finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. I love that. One day, he'll wipe away every tear. One day, everything will be new. So, you know, we live in a world right now where the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God is not yet here. You know, we're talking today about things that are huge concepts to grasp. I understand that. But it's important that we understand some of these things. Why? Because it can help base how we live our lives. Like I said at the start, what we know will affect what we, how we live our lives. So that day has been defeated. The enemy has been defeated. But as we've said before, he's still deadly. We still need to be aware of that. You know, as a pastor, I have the privilege at times of being with people's happiest moments. Not all that long ago, we... Uh, I was involved in praying a prayer of thanksgiving for, for baby Zoya. It's times where I've taken people in here's weddings and things like that. It's been wonderful. You get to be with people at the, the best times of their life. But also sometimes you get to be with people sometimes at the saddest points of their life. You get to weep with people as they're weeping. But one day, one day, every tear will be wiped away. One day we have the, the, the incredible future that awaits us. Great, uh, you know, reuniting of people who have been lost. All these sort of things. I think the day ahead is wonderful. And I believe Jesus is wonderful. And this morning, you know, in conclusion, and the band are going to come and we're going to finish. The final thing I want you to consider is this. Consider your response. Consider your response. You see, as we said at the start, sin entered the world and all of us inherit this sinful nature. That's why we don't have to be taught what's right and wrong. That's why we don't have to understand what's, what, what's, what's uh, you know, when we're doing something wrong and we have this moral compass built into us. But also, because of that, we're aware something within us. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let me ask. Without recognizing the greatest day of history, how do you plan on dealing with the consequences? 
How do you plan on covering up? Because there is no other way. There is only one. God didn't abandon us to our own devices. The fall was certainly the darkest day in history, but it led to the greatest day where God himself showed love by providing a solution for what mankind had messed up. And God one day is going to make all things new. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 says this, for, the sin, for sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, as I said, we've got to consider our choice. Each of us has a choice. God doesn't force you to follow him. That's not something that, uh, that he does. In the same way as he gave them free will in the garden, we have a choice today as to what we do. But my question to you today is, if you don't know him, what are you waiting for? If you don't know him, then this morning you can know the solution to that shame and fear and all these things that is in our life can find it in Jesus. And we can appear before the Father and have relationship with him again as it was intended to be because of what Jesus has done. In a moment, we're going to share communion together, but I want us to bow our heads and I'm going to pray. And if you don't know Jesus, I, I encourage you this morning to, to pray this prayer in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you today, Come into my life. I recognize that you are the solution for my sin. I thank you, God, that in love, you gave me a choice. But Lord, today I willingly choose to follow you. Today I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And today I ask you to make me new. Today I choose to make you Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The bound will 
let the church say amen Death is defeated Jesus is risen This is our faith The good news of grace Oh, let the church say amen Oh, let the church Welcome to New Life News. Here's what's coming up this week. On a Sunday morning, we have our prayer, which is free to drop in and out of at Sandview Neighbourhood Centre. On a Sunday morning at 11am, we have our Sunday service. This is a really good chance to worship together as a church. Every Sunday at 5pm, our online service is posted to YouTube. Why not subscribe to our New Life Shetland live streams channel to stay up to date? We, of course, have our half hour prayer on a Monday at 7pm. This is a brilliant opportunity to pray alongside other people. Now here's this month's youth program. Starting the 2nd of November, we have our Unite Bible Study in Tim and Rachel's flat every second week. Every Thursday at 7.30pm in the Stony Hill Hall, we have our youth club. This includes lots of games and fun. The first Sunday of every month, we have our youth cafe. This is a great chance for the youth to learn about God in a way that's relative to them. If you want to learn anything more about our youth programme, DM us on our NL Youth Instagram page or message Tim or Rachel. Our life groups are back in November. Through this we'll be learning how to study the Bible and get the most out of our devotions. After school on a Wednesday we have our kids club. It goes from 4 to 5.30 and is a great opportunity for kids to make new friends and have lots of fun. Good morning friends. Do you realise that it's only seven weeks to Christmas this weekend and eight weeks to New Year? Um, it's been lovely that in the last year several new families have joined the fellowship and that's why I'm talking to you this morning uh, for the benefit of, of everybody but uh, particularly for people that have not been with the church at Christmas time and New Year before. The background to this is that our church has provided meals for the older people in Lerwick for the last 27 years it's because the meals on wheel service at the council runs for people that uh, deserve them during the course of the year, but like everybody else deserve some time off at Christmas. And so Christmas Day and New Year's Day, they don't provide the service and we as the church do. But due to the COVID situation, which we're still living with, although it's slightly different and better, praise God, this year, uh, we had to change some of the ways we did it. And so one of the changes was that we do need food. In the past, we've asked people in the fellowship to buy food and bring it along to Coys on the Christmas Eve afternoon or, or New Year's Eve afternoon but last year due to Covid, last Christmas New Year period and again this year as Covid is still with us uh, we're encouraging people in the fellowship who'd like to support this this work which is very much appreciated in the local community for the last 27 years to actually give money rather than buy food. We have in fact already got all the food ordered and some of it is already in Carol's freezer and in my house uh, ready for the provision so the best way you could support us this year is not by buying any food but by giving financially towards the cost which is quite substantial so if you'd like to do that then please have a word with your owner as church treasurer and either give her cash uh, in an envelope perhaps mark christmas meals or alternatively get from rona the bank account details and then if you want to do it by a straight uh, backs transfer uh, from your account to the church account that would be very helpful but we'd be grateful for help in other ways as well uh, we prepare the vegetables on Christmas Eve afternoon and New Year's Eve afternoon. Um, takes about an hour and a half. Uh, we do it at Coy's Baptist Church. Very kindly they let us use their big kitchen there, which is great. And then on Christmas and New Year morning, uh, Brian Lang, a member of the fellowship as many of you know, and, and Carol uh, cook the meal. And then we ask for about four volunteers on both mornings to come in and help with the serving of the meals up and then for that team of people to stay on and help clear up all the pots and pans. And we ask those people to come at about 11.30. At about 11.45, we're very grateful to have the team of drivers arrive. Uh, and this year, because of the numbers, we did 42 meals each day last year. We're expecting to do 45 or 46 meals each day this year. We would need eight drivers um, with a vehicle and a helper because it does need two people to carry the food from the vehicles to the different houses. Uh, the helper doesn't need to be an adult, it can be a young person and this is probably a very good way of getting the young members of the church and families involved. So 11.45 we really need eight cars with drivers and helpers to arrive and deliver the meals. 
We, each car de delivers six or seven meals to addresses. The route is always clearly given to you and it's just great fun to do. And we normally finish completely by 1.15, so it isn't a huge amount of time that is, is required to help with this. Um, so just to sum up, we need four people to help with veg preparation uh, on the eve of the day. We need four people to help dish the meals up and clean up. We need eight drivers and helpers. There will be lists available at the back of the Sambine Hall uh, this, this Sunday. And so if you could please con seriously consider this uh, and then sign up appropriately. And the list will be there for several weeks, but we would really like to know where we're going if we could please by the end of November. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to working with you all. Thank you. If you'd like any more information on any of the events I said today, please contact us at admin at newlifeshetland.com or on any of our social medias. But that's all for now. Have a great week. So there we are. We've been looking at the fall of man. And I pray that if you don't know Jesus, that you will come to know him. The solution to the problem. If you don't, then why not get in contact with us? Get in contact with me at pastor at newlifeshetland.com. We'll be back online next Sunday at 5 p.m. And we'll also be in person at 11 a.m. at Sandbean Neighbourhood Centre. We hope you're able to join with us. Until then, have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.